Um, but it, okay. Anyway, <laughs> moving forward, um, I want you to um, realize that this has been a uh, long and contentious issue. Uh, we may be coming up with some uh, solutions. Uh, climate change is going to push it, but uh, we welcome your participation. We will leave as much time as we can at the end of this presentation. And um, with that, um, I'm going to turn it over. Oh, I, I want to say one more thing. Um, uh, if you would never ever have the opportunity to actually go to the Salton Sea, and I would suggest in winter uh, that you take a chance to see it. And we're also probably going to be talking a little bit about the Colorado River Delta in Mexico. The combination of the two um, are, are unique. Okay, here's our webinar ground rules. If you have technical difficulties, please use the chat feature to let us know. When you're asking a question, use the Q&A feature. Type in your question, click send. They will be answered again after the presentation. If you have a poor connection, move closer to your wireless router, router or turn off other services that might be using it or even turn off your own picture. Um, all attendees are gonna be muted by default until it's your opportunity uh, to listen to your question. Um, we're not actually gonna be physically doing it like we used to do in the dialogue. Again, here's how you're gonna ask your question after the end of the presentations. You're going to click send. You can upvote. For anybody who's looking and wants an answer to a question, you can actually upvote it through the webinar process. Now we'll move to the top. All right, again, we're gonna uh, do quick introductions, presentations, and the dialogue, which is the question after, afterwards, and then we may have some concluding remarks at the very end. We try to end right at 1.30. We run over a little bit. Our speakers said they could stay on, but um, we wanna be respectful of everybody's time as well. So on your screen, you can see our speakers. If you're dialing in by phone, we have Patrick O'Dow from Salt Sea Authority, Den Denham from the San Diego County Water Authority, JB Hamby from Imperial Irrigation District, Michael Cohen from the Pacific Institute, and Frank Luis from the Audubon Society. And I'm actually gonna turn it over to Patrick O'Dowd from the Salton Sea Authority to begin his video and the program. Thank you very much. The Salton Sea, located in the heart of California's rich Colorado River Delta, has been part of the region's lifeblood and heritage for many centuries. Originally a part of the Gulf of California, the Delta was formed from deposits of the Colorado River, carved out of the Grand Canyon and elsewhere along its journey to the Gulf. Over the millennia, the river has meandered about the Delta, sometimes flowing into the Gulf, other times swinging to the north and filling the Salton Sink, creating an enormous fresh body of water used by the local tribe for fishing and life-sustaining water. The most recent filling of the sink was recorded in the late 1700s, but its frequent meanderings into the region has contributed richly to the local culture and way of life. The ecosystem at the sea is continually changing. Since its most recent filling in the early 20th century, it has continued to mature, having evolved into a salty and nutrient-rich water body with no outlet. Most of the water that flows into the Salton Sea is agricultural drain water. Agricultural use of the Salton Sea drainage is protected by order signed by President Coolidge in the 1920s, reserving the land under the Salton Sea as a drainage reservoir. Over time, the salinity in the Salton Sea has continued to increase, and recent measures of salinity exceeded 6%. By comparison, water brought into the valley from the Colorado River averages around 0.7% salinity, and seawater around 3.5%. Over the next 50 years, salinity is expected to increase fivefold due to the continued and increasing evaporation of seawater. 
This increase in salinity has and will continue to dramatically affect the types of life the sea can sustain. The idea to import Colorado River water to California's Delta region was first advanced by Dr. O.M. Wozencraft in 1859, who invested much of his adult life and all of his financial resources pursuing the idea, but died in 1877, his vision unrealized. However, in 1893, Charles Rockwood and the California Development Company picked up where Wozencraft left off, first by appropriating substantial, high-priority Colorado River water rights, then by diverting its flows into the Imperial Valley beginning in 1901. Unfortunately, in 1905, temporary measures developed to increase canal flows during the winter months proved inadequate to hold back the river when the spring floods arrived and the entire flow of the Colorado River streamed into the valley for nearly two straight years. Exhausting its financial resources and efforts to close the river's breach, the California Development Company failed and the breach was finally closed at great expense by the Southern Pacific Railroad in 1907. For its efforts, the railroad briefly acquired the water rights of the defunct California Development Company, which were later acquired by the Imperial Irrigation District, formed in 1911. Water rights on the Colorado were generally established through a policy of first in use, first in right, meaning if you are the first to use it, you have the highest priority right to it. The increasing activity in the lower Colorado River, and particularly in California, caused concern for the less developed upper basin states, fearing they would find themselves without water rights for their future if rapid development in the southern basin states continued. To address these concerns, the Colorado River Commission was formed to negotiate and implement a compact governing rights and uses of water of the Colorado River, and when implemented, would serve to divide the waters of the Colorado between the states of the upper and lower basins. This agreement was also a precursor to the development of dams and water storage on the Colorado River. The compact was signed in 1922 by all basin state representatives, but required the ratification of each state, and Arizona refused to do so. In order to reduce the risk of future flooding in the Imperial and Coachella Valleys, conserve water for domestic and agricultural purposes, and for the general generation of power, the Boulder Canyon Project Act was passed by Congress in 1928, authorizing the construction of the Hoover Dam and the All-American Canal. President Hoover signed the legislation, even though Arizona refused to sign the compact. In conjunction with the Hoover Dam Project, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California authorized the construction of the Colorado River Aqueduct, a 242-mile-long pipeline capable of carrying 1.2 million acre-feet annually to the rapidly developing coastal plains of Southern California. Subsequently, Arizona sued California in a series of lawsuits that spanned from 1934 up to 2000, which resulted in a court's decision that required the state of California to stay within its 4.4 million acre-foot allocation. Under this allotment, water allocations to urban customers in Southern California would be reduced by half, and the capacity of the Colorado River aqueduct would become significantly underutilized. A series of agriculture to urban water transfer agreements, collectively known as the Quantification Settlement Agreement, or the QSA, were signed in 2003 as a mechanism to achieve California's 4.4 plan. Today's session will discuss the QSA through the lens of 2021 and the sea's lingering environmental challenges. We will also touch on complicated current issues, including the Colorado River drought, the future for local disadvantaged communities, and lessons learned from the QSA that might inform future water transfers, as well as historical and current barriers to getting projects at the sea underway. So we covered a couple thousand years in a shade under six minutes. Taking, taking a look back at the past 30 years or so should go pretty quickly, right? Hi, I'm Patrick O'Dowd, and I'm the executive director of the Salton Sea Authority, a position I've held since last November. Prior to that, I was a director with the Coachella Valley Water District, and as their representative, served on the board of the Salton Sea Authority for the past six years. I was recently asked, and frankly, as a former director, I had from time to time wondered myself whether the Salton Sea Authority had any real authority. And as its new executive director, I thought that was a pretty important question and required a compelling answer. 
And the answer is yes. In fact, we exercise two types of authority. The first is legal authority, organized as a joint powers agency by the state of California in 1992. The authority has the legal ability to enter into agreements, hire employees and agents, take on debt, acquire property through sale, lease, or eminent domain, even to levy taxes. The authority has never exercised its ability to acquire property, take on debt, or levy taxes or fees. In addition, the authority has a delegated authority through its members. The board is led by elected public officials, including two supervisors each from Riverside and Imperial counties, two directors each from the Imperial Irrigation District and the Coachella Valley Water District, and the tribal chair and secretary from the Torres Martinez Desert Cahuilla Indians. As elected representatives who are accountable to every voter in the Imperial and Coachella Valley, authority leadership wields considerable influence in the local communities and by extension in Sacramento and in DC. Miriam Webster defines authority as the power to influence or command thought, opinion, or behavior. That's what we do. We were created to direct and coordinate actions relating to the improvement of water quality and stabilization of water ele elevation and to enhance recreation and economic development potential of the Salton Sea and for other beneficial uses, recognizing the importance of the Salton Sea for the continuation of the dynamic agricultural economy in the Imperial and Riverside counties. The authority exercises its strong local leadership in consultation and collaboration with its project partners, including the state of California and the federal government to facilitate a promising future for the sea and region. To accomplish this, plans, policies, and projects have been, have been developed and are being developed by members and partners to address immediate impacts to human health and safety, to restore critical habitat lost to the declining sea, and to create opportunities for sustainable, indeed thriving communities. Health, habitat, and opportunity, or what we call Salton Sea H2O, with a vision to transition the sea and region from what it once was to what it sustainably can be. As the earlier video illustrated, the history of the sea and region is both rich and complicated. In its heyday, the sea was a recreational destination of choice for Southern Californians with resort communities in the 50s and 60s springing up all around the sea. But its continual de decline and its impact to the adjacent villages has resulted in some of the most underserved communities in our state living with poor air quality, impaired water quality for some communities, and a general lack of basic services and opportunity. To be sure, the sea has been in a state of transition since its initial filling in 1905, and the inevitable unmitigated outcome of the sea was likely known as early as the 20s. When Calvin Coolidge set the sea aside to create an evaporation pan for the surplus and wastewater from Imperial Valley irrigation development, the future was certainly clear by the mid 20s when in 1950, Elvin Hughes, then president of the Imperial Irrigation District described the Salton Sea as dedicated for use as a drainage and waste cesspool for Coachella and Imperial Valleys, a cesspool. He went on to say that a shortage of water in the future will make it impossible to ever keep the water of the lake of such quality to make it desirable or even passable for recreational purposes. The historic and continuing declines in water quality, coupled with flooding at the sea in the 70s and 80s, and subsequent mass die-offs of fish and birds resulted in mounting public pressure for action at the sea. Thank you. Dan? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Dan Denham. I'm the Deputy General Manager at the San Diego County Water Authority. Um, I want to provide a little more history on, on how we got to where we are today, uh, both in terms of the uh, transfer between the Imperial Irrigation District and the Metropolitan Water District, the QSA transfers, um, and how all of that impacts the sea. And really, it all begins with a series of very important events um, and decisions by the State Water Resource Control Board 
um, in the 80s uh, relating back to the Colorado River, how Colorado River water is used in California, um, and as Patrick referenced the flooding that was occurring um, at the Salton Sea. So next slide, please. So in the late, uh, late 70s, about 1 million acre feet of Colorado River water uh, used in the IID service area was entering the Salton Sea through, as you can imagine, an extensive system of agricultural drains and permitted discharges into the New and Alamo River. Um, at, at the time, this water accounted for about 70% of the, the total inflow to the sea with the remaining balance coming from uh, the Coachella Valley in Mexico. So by 1984, it was determined through a state water board order known as decision 1600 that this flooding or water loss as it was characterized could be uh, prevented through a series of uh, reasonable conservation measures, measures. And that is essentially what IID uh, embarked upon, um, which was a, a comprehensive water conservation plan um, to address uh, the issues contained in decision 1600. Um, four years later, the state board reviewed that plan and found that conservation in the amount of 367,000 acre feet was a reasonable long-term conservation goal. Um, and it was you know, thoroughly uh, analyzed as part of uh, the next water rights order, water rights order 8820. Um, so central to that order was the state board's endorsement of water transfers. Um, one of which was already under consideration, uh, which was uh, between the IID and MWD. Um, both would be consistent um, with decision 1600 regarding reasonable and beneficial use of Colorado River water in California, or, or in other words, the flooding that was occurring. Um, but, it, but it also checked another box, um, and that uh, had to do with the state's desire to reduce MWD's demand on state water project and Bay Delta supplies. So. Um, included in the water rights order was an acknowledgement that uh, according to the EIR accompanying the conservation plan, several adverse effects to the Salton Sea would occur. So this included lower elevation, increased salinity, reduction of uh, wetland habitat, loss of property value, um, uh, et cetera, you know, among a number of other things. So while the EIR discussed mitigation measures for these environmental impacts in very general terms, it did not identify specific mitigation measures available to rectify the impacts to the environment. Um, moving on to uh, 1986, uh, a notice of determination was filed regarding the environmental analysis with appropriate local, state, and federal parties uh, with findings of overriding considerations. In these findings was the acknowledgement that water conservation measures would produce significant effects on the environment. However, there were specific economic, social, and other considerations made um, that made uh, alternatives uh, to the project infeasible, which was essentially to do nothing, um, which would contradict the state water board order, or for IID ratepayers to finance conservation measures uh, which there would be no benefit um, as water would fall, conserved water would fall to junior water users uh, for free. So thus started the first conserved water transfer out of the valley through a 100,000 acre foot uh, water transfer agreement with IID and MWD. Next slide, please. From uh, 1990 through uh, 1999, California lawfully used uh, between 100,000 and 800,000 acre feet per year, more than its 4.4 uh, million acre foot apportionment that uh, was referenced in the video that you all just saw. Um, this was made possible by the lower basin states of Arizona and Nevada, not taking their full allotment of supplies. Um, so for many years, more than half of the water um, that the urban coast used or received from the Colorado River was actually surplus supply. Um, so this, this reliance on surplus water, of course, began to cause concerns at both the state and federal level um, in terms of sustainability of California's water use. Um, so for the water authority, um, in the absence of really any local water supplies, um, we began to evaluate potential imported supplies that might be transferred from sources north of the Tehachapi Mountains to uh, Southern California or from the Colorado River. 
Um, so what happened was this effort revealed that the state was not issuing new state water project contracts and that existing contracts um, really prevented the distribution of state water project water within the boundaries of another contractor. Um, likewise, the Water Authority did not hold a Section 5 contract or an entitlement to Colorado River water. And consequently, under um, federal law, any new contract um, would assume a far more junior priority with extremely low water reliability. So all that being said, given the, the geographic proximity between the Valley and the Water Authority um, and the amount of water um, under control by IID, um, an agreement with IID became a logical focus point for the Water Authority. So in addition to having an economic interest in transferring water uh, to pay for on-farm and system improvements, um, IID continued to face uh, pressure really from the State Water Board regarding decision 1600 and the, the Water Rights Order 8820. So that all came to uh, fruition in February of 1995 where IID and uh, the Water Authority entered into an MOA for at that time, what was a 500,000 acre foot uh, water transfer. Uh, next slide, please. So by 1996, the Secretary of the Interior declared that uh, California's increasing use of Colorado River water for agricultural purposes was, was placing the apportionments of the Colorado River, uh, uh, the the apportionments of the Colorado River Basin states at risk. So to reduce the dependency on surplus Colorado River water and to protect the Colorado River Basin states from future shortages, the secretary determined that California would be required to reduce its use of river water to 4.4 million acre feet, primarily through agricultural water conservation efforts. Um, so in response to the secretary's directive, negotiations amongst various California parties began in 1998 and continued well through the federal administration in 2000. And so what started uh, as a discussion regarding the quantification of water rights soon evolved into expansive negotiations on state water project exchanges and future water transfers which was reinforced by the Colorado River Board of California's endorsement to have water transfers as the primary vehicle to provide the state a soft landing from its uh, use of surplus Colorado River water. Concurrent with these discussions were negotiations between IID and the Water Authority um, in what emerged as the 1998 uh, Water Authority IID Conserved Water Transfer Agreement. Um, at which point the two parties uh, took the, the proposed project to the State Water Board uh, for approval based on that entity's continuing jurisdiction, um, as I previously referenced. So um, discussions really reached a climax um, in October of 2002 when the State Board issued an order to approve the transfer agreement for the uh, change in point of use and place of diversion from Imperial Valley to San Diego for up to 75 years. Um, the, the decision came after a 15-day evidentiary hearing, um, which commenced with the release of a draft EIR that contained an extensive state water board mandated environmental mitigation plan for the Salton Sea. Um, among uh, other things, the new water right, the, the new water right order uh, mandated 15 years of salinity and elevation control at the Salton Sea. Um, this this occurred by providing what has been phrased as salt and sea mitigation water. Um, and they also uh, prescribed a, a detailed monitoring plan for air quality impacts. Um, so while the, the issue or the issuance of, of this order for the Water Authority and IID built upon an eight, was really an 18 year process to manage agricultural water use, um, the cost of environmental mitigation became a significant sticking point that served to stall negotiations on the QSA. Uh, next slide, please. So to resolve and, and allocate the responsibility amongst the, the Water Authority, IID, and the Coachella Valley Water District in the state of California, a cost-sharing agreement uh, was developed and a joint power of authority was established. Um, these commitments were memorialized in a suite of three laws that were accelerated through the legislature 
in 2003 and 2004. Um, one, one bill in particular placed the limit on the amount of, of money the Water Authority, IID, and Coachella Valley Water District uh, would have to pay for environmental mitigation of the QSA transfers. That limit was over uh, $400 million amongst the parties. Um, the legislation also provided that under the JPA agreement, the state of California would bear the additional cost of quote unquote environmental, environmental mitigation if there was any additional costs beyond the amounts committed by the parties. Not only that, the state also committed to unconditionally restore the Salton Sea, all of which is in fish and game code. Um, so as I referenced, nearly $100 million was earmarked to provide 800,000 acre feet worth of Salton Sea mitigation water to the sea for a 15 year period. It was largely con uh, contemplated that during this period, the mitigation water would cause the sea to remain in a sort of pre QSA static state and allow uh, time for California, the California legislature to develop a plan that would address the long-term health of the salt and sea ecosystem and, and essentially have mitigation as the precursor to a larger salt and sea restoration effort. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the setup of the Joint Powers Authority, the Coachella Valley Water District is the legal counsel, the Water Authority is the administrative and financial arm, and the IID is uh, the entity that is the boots on the ground carrying out the air quality management plan um, and making permanent improvements to the exposed shoreline. Um, the state through the Department of Fish and Wildlife serves as the chair of the, the four member board. And so what, what you see there on the screen is, is where we're at today with mitigation. We have spent $156 million to date, largely um, uh, that most of it, as you can see there is mitigation water, nearly 100 million. We have 136 million planned out into the future that will really focus on permanent air quality projects on the ground, which is expected to be uh, the Joint Powers Authority's largest expense going forward. In, in terms of uh, the, the plan, the mitigation and monitoring plan that's prescribed in the EIR and EIS, um, it's a four-step process uh, to, um, to control access uh, to the sea, um, to develop a comprehensive research and monitoring plan. It was contemplated back in 2003 that emission credits would be available. However, I don't believe that that is feasible anymore. And then finally, um, direct emission control measures. Um, Next slide, please. So in terms of just to wrap it up here, um, you know, 18 years later, what went right, what went wrong? I think mitigation versus restoration will always be an issue. And, and candidly, it's because of the way it's codified in Fish and Game Code, because of the various contracts that all the parties have together, um, and, and the fact that it was litigated over uh, for 10 years. But nonetheless, it's admittedly very confusing to the public. And quite frankly, I'm not sure that there really is a difference between what a mitigation or a restoration project looks like. It's more contractual and financial in nature, which is why we keep hearing it come up. Um, I think another challenge that the parties have lived through uh, was the $9 billion uh, preferred alternative of several years ago. Recall mitigation water was intended to provide the 15 year period to allow for a long term restoration plan um, or the preferred alternative. Um, but really with a $9 billion price tag uh, uh, 15 or so years ago, it immediately became a non-starter. And I think collectively we all lost some time. Um, one thing, another thing that comes to mind that, that I think is, is sort of a, an unknown is the impact of the natural environment. I think it needs further analysis. Um, fugitive windblown dust in the desert is, is uncontrollable and not necessarily, not necessarily related to the QSA, but Nonetheless, it, it needs to be accounted for in the mass balance of, of the air quality impacts and the analysis that we do um, collectively uh, out in the Imperial and Coachella Valley. Um, I think on the positive side, the coordination of matters between um, the QSA JPA and the state has worked well, um, as has the, the coordination of the parties coming together to finalize the stipulated order a few years ago. Um, it, it, it sort of kicked off the state's salt and sea management plan and, and gave everything a real focus. 
And, you know, finally, I, I think the real positive is that funding is now available outside of the JPA um, to get more projects done um, and, and have more uh, permanent things on the ground to fulfill the state's uh, restoration obligation. Um, that was my last slide. I believe uh, I'm going to hand it over now to uh, Director J.B. Hamby um, from the Imperial Irrigation District. Sorry about that, I was on mute. Um, my name is J.B. Hamby, I'm the Vice President of the IID Board of Directors, and uh, we'll go to the next slide here. And, and just as a, a high level, I think it's important to note uh, as, uh, that there is a symbiotic relationship, the very critical one between Imperial Valley agriculture um, and the Salton Sea, most particularly the, the wildlife that enjoy uh, one of these last few refuges on the entire uh, Pacific Flyway. 95% uh, of the wetlands in the state of California have disappeared for all intents and purposes. And so this uh, salty lake in the middle of the desert has become this, uh, this refuge for them um, for over 400 plus species and varieties of, of birds that make their way from Argentina to Asia on an annual basis. And as was previously mentioned, there's been different waves in terms of salt and sea where it's been at its problems over time. And, for a number of years, it was too full, and there was flooding occurring at the Salton Sea. Um, but that's certainly not the problem we have anymore, quite the opposite. Our problem is, is that the Salton Sea is now too empty, and we have this receding shoreline, the dust emissions, uh, and the reduced viability for, for fish to live in the Salton Sea. 99.5% of them are gone at this point, and two-thirds of the birds have, have now left. Um, what's important to note here is that there is this paradox here, I think that's important to note about the Salton Sea, which is um, that conservation, while very useful for a number of purposes, freeing up supply, it also has this adverse impact on the Salton Sea. The more water that is uh, more efficiently and more conservatively used means that there's less water feeding the Salton Sea and maintaining the, the habitat there. Um, so general facts here, the Salton Sea is the largest lake in the Colorado River Basin, and basically 100% of that water, with the exception of some side flows, comes from the Colorado River primarily as agricultural uh, drainage. That's the largest contributor to uh, the sea remaining as its best elevations possible under these adverse circumstances, under these transfers uh, that send water to the coast rather than to the Salton Sea. Um, but that drain water does contribute and, and keep viable uh, a wet salt and sea where birds and, and the remaining fish can, can thrive at and keep that playa wet as far as long as possible. Next slide. So just a, a few points on the QSA and Dan did cover a, a great deal of what was involved in there. Uh, from a very high level, looking at what has been successful and what has not been so successful with this 2003 agreement is one, when it comes to water leaving Imperial Valley and being sent to other places like San Diego, that's been very successful. IID has met its transfer obligations faithfully every year for its contract. Uh, money has come in every year, either to the, the QSA JPA or, or to IID to fund conservation projects because those cost a lot of money to to uh, encourage and incentivize these extraordinary methods of conservation to make that water available to help California live within its entitlement. Um, also, these peace treaties have been successful up to this point that were inked as part of the, the QSA agreements, uh, which are non or the lack of challenges or other districts and the federal government uh, agreeing to not challenge IID's uh, reasonable and beneficial use of our Colorado River entitlement. And uh, also what has held up over time is that new transfers are limited by our state water code through the QSA uh, without uh, the board's authorization of the IID. Now, the big question mark here though is this restoration bit of the Salton Sea. And if we go to the, the next slide here, this has been something that's been the most troubled uh, part of, of our progress or lack thereof in QSA responsibilities. So QSA was signed in 2003, and over 11 years time, almost nothing happened on the state of California's side to meet its statutory obligations to restore the Salton Sea. 
Uh, that led to what was ultimately a great deal of frustration on the IID uh, side of things in 2014, who then exercised its uh, continuing authority by submitting a petition to the State Water Resources Control Board requiring the C be restored or efforts be taken on as part of the state of California's obligation as a condition of the QSA. In essence, uh, the QSA can keep going just so long as, as the salt and sea is being restored, uh, which had not been happening up to that point. Um, so in 2017, the State Water Resources Control Board realized that transfers being turned off was going to be a scary thing, and the state needed to get moving on meeting these very delayed uh, uh, agreements toward their, uh, their responsibilities at the Salton Sea and put out a revised water order uh, that set annual commitments and milestones and a framework for restoration mitigation efforts. That was certainly very helpful in order to get something written down on paper. Um, and up until very recently here, the, there was no activity whatsoever on the state side. There has been recent progress, which is very much welcomed. Uh, however, it's very far behind and there's a lot of catching up to do, although it's starting to happen at this point. Next slide. So the next chapter really after the DCP, or excuse me, the QSA, too many acronyms, on the Colorado River uh, was the 2007 interim guidelines, which were meant to help slow the decline of Lake Powell and Lake Mead at that point. That was seen as not enough. Lake Mead and Lake Powell continued to drop in their elevation. So the drought contingency plan was worked on for a number of years uh, as an interstate set of agreements and also with Mexico's participation uh, to help slow the decline uh, of Lake Mead in particular, as far as our conversation goes here in the lower basin. Um, and as part of that, the IID conditioned its participation. Mind you, the IID at this point or at that point had been the single largest contributor to helping wean use off of the Colorado River, which had already been stressed enough by contributing 500,000 acre feet, half a million acre feet a year to other places in California so we could wean ourselves off of our overuse that we're borrowing from Arizona as a state, not IID, but other urban areas in particular. Uh, but as part of IID's participation in another one of these federal agreements, it was very important to IID um, that if we were gonna bail out Lake Mead, we had to do something about the Salton Sea because more water being left behind in Lake Mead means less being uh, put into the Salton Sea. And so there is that critical Colorado River Salton Sea link that was important very much to IID and those who live in the Imperial Valley, like myself. Um, but for others, like you can see in one of these Desert Sun bylines here, uh, there was a whole group of basin-wide uh, principals who chimed in to basically flog IID for our non-participation, so long as the Salton Sea wasn't being honored uh, in these interstate drought negotiations on the Colorado River. So there was some support and name um, but certainly not in, in action, which is uh, another gaping wound there. Next slide. So this is really what we're dealing with here. This is already lingering from the 2003 QSA water transfer. Uh, this is, you can see the, the, the rings here of how far back the Salton Sea goes to its furthest, furthest extent in 2047 when it stabilizes. Uh, and you can see in the next slide here uh, that this is what the the Salton Sea looks like when it's basically half empty after the transfers have run their course from 2040, 2003, excuse me, to 2047, uh, which is several or many, many square miles of exposed playa and a hypersaline lake in the middle there. Next slide. So on the ground, it has been uh, challenging, although there are some green shoots of opportunity opening up here. The state is 15 years behind in terms of its uh, statutory obligations uh, with the uh, QSA and, and the impacts on the Salton Sea. Um, the projects themselves are understandably very complicated and there's a lot of burdensome permitting that's required uh, as part of this. Um, and then also when it comes to the IID and the state meeting the, the boots on the ground uh, responsibilities of, of making these mitigation activities, it's really been hampered recently by some local regulatory issues as, as you can may have seen or heard on, on one particular site called Red Hill Bay, um, which was symbolic in nature at one point for uh, progress moving forward, but is now really 
demonstrated some real serious problems with uh, ongoing progress here in order for locals to work together. Next slide. So the next chapter here is we're entering into the renegotiation of the 2007 interim guidelines on the Colorado River that is meant to uh, look at Lake Powell and Lake Mead, how those dams at Glen Canyon Dam and Hoover Dam are operated and, and the larger Colorado River system at a time when there is more water being taken out of the river than the river is, is contributing into these reservoirs. Uh, particularly the effects of, of climate change and extended drought we're seeing here. And that contributes to what's known as the structural deficit where there's less water in the river than there is being taken out. We essentially are having this declining bank account, so to speak. Um, and what's going to be part of these future negotiations here by 2026 is, is starting to discuss allocations, not of water, but of pain uh, in who's going to take the cuts and, and to what extent. And another large question here, as it was in the DCP, is what is going to be done about the Salton Sea? Uh, we're entering into the next set of agreements on the Colorado River, but when it comes to the agreements that were signed in 2003, this large sticking point then in 2003 is the same very large sticking point today, which is the Salton Sea, which continues uh, to be in its troubled state. Next slide. And just as a high level here, IID is the largest user on the Colorado River. And, and the problems we have here in our backyard are not parochial or unique to us. They're larger Colorado River problems. And what's been a position of our board um, as an agency overall is we're not interested in any new water transfers from the district. Uh, we can't continue to drain the Salton Sea to fill Lake Mead. We're very interested in, in working and partnering uh, on a larger level throughout the river to make adjustments, but uh, new transfers are, are not in the cards. Another difficult issue for us has been that as the largest user on the river, ironically, when you look at those bathtub rings um, uh, around Lake Mead uh, behind the Hoover Dam, there's a lot of empty space there that we'd love to help fill up over time, uh, but that's not been available to us. Had that been the case, then we would have seen uh, much higher elevation at, at, at Lake Mead and less of a, a significant problem that we're seeing today. Uh, but an overall perspective here, the Colorado River and the Salton Sea are integrally tied together. Uh, the IID really is the tie between those two. And uh, new Colorado River agreements really depend on honoring old ones, uh, which continue to linger to this day, which is the QSA and I'll hand it off to the next bunch. Thanks, uh, I wanna thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, I'm gonna, my name is Michael Cohen I'm with the Pacific Institute. Next slide, please. So the Institute's a small nonprofit uh, based in Oakland. I've been working on salt and sea issues for more than 20 years, put together a number of reports on, on the sea which are all available on our website. Next slide, please. So the Salton Sea presents a number of interesting questions. Uh, the speakers have raised some of these already. Um, I think some of the, the biggest questions are, why should we save it and what happens if we don't? Um, next slide, please. My, this is just a quick overview of, of my talk, a little bit more about the background, um, some of the challenges we're facing and what some potential solutions at the Salton Sea could look like. Next slide, please. Uh, so we've seen an earlier map of this. Uh, Salton Sea is about 130 miles west-southwest of Metropolitan's headquarters. And you can see from this satellite image, the Colorado River Delta uh, used to be filled with uh, wetlands and riparian forests, now largely replaced with irrigated agriculture. Next slide, please. Uh, the previous speakers have identified many of the key factors driving changes at, at the Salton Sea. Um, one key factor to remember is that the Salton Sea is, has always been dynamic uh, and we're seeing a, a new uh, effort to, to impose some, some stability on, on a very dynamic system. Next slide. So uh, one of the key points I really wanna emphasize and I think it's important for uh, all the listeners to, to think about here is that uh, the transfers uh, from Imperial Irrigation District uh, to metropolitan service area, both to San Diego uh, and to MWD itself, have provided uh, water supply reliability for some 19 million people. 
at the expense of the Salton Sea. So despite the extraordinary and extreme drought blanketing California and the Colorado River Basin right now, Southern California, these 19 million people are likely to avoid reductions because of this water supply reliability. So the trade-off again, uh, water supply reliability um, and likely uh, the avoidance of rationing at least this year and probably next year for Southern California residents uh, at the expense of the Salton Sea. And uh, this accounting from IID, uh, you can see at the bottom, uh, almost 4 million acre feet uh, just since 2003 have been transferred uh, to metropolitan service area. And then going back to the original transfer uh, to, to metropolitan, that's some 6 million acre feet of water moved from uh, Imperial Valley uh, to, the, to the coast. Next slide, please. So what does this look like? Uh, this shows the elevation of the Salton Sea over time, filled back in 1905, then rapidly, uh, the elevation rapidly dropped as, as uh, they plugged the leak in the, in the river. And then as uh, irrigated agriculture expanded in the region, elevations of the, the Salton Sea rose, leading to some of the um, water orders that were discussed previously. Uh, and then really starting in uh, about 2000, and then with the signing of the QSA, the elevation of the Salton Sea has dropped. Current elevation of the Salton Sea is about 238 feet below sea level, some uh, more than nine feet lower than it was in 2003 when the QSA was signed. And salinity is now double that of the ocean. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a different way of looking at uh, these changes. Uh, the dark blue is what the Salton Sea was at uh, when the QSA was signed. The lighter blue uh, is where the Salton Sea was back in about 2015. Uh, and then this tomato soup color is where the Salton Sea uh, is expected to be uh, in about a decade. Uh, it depends on the inflow projections, uh, how fast the Salton Sea is going to drop. But uh, currently, that's what we're looking at. And the salinity there could be uh, more than double what it is now, uh, eliminating all the invertebrates in the Salton Sea and, and most of the habitat for birds and, ex, um, and exposing some 150 square miles of lake bed, uh, creating a lot more dust sources. Sorry if you can go back. A lot more dust sources. Um, currently it's about 37 square miles, or the Salton Sea is about 37 square miles smaller than it was in 2003. Next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, so again, here's some of the trade-offs. So we have water supply reliability for Southern California for metropolitan service area at the expense of the people uh, and the wildlife uh, in the Salton Sea region. Next slide. Uh, as has been discussed, there's a number of challenges uh, and a number of reasons why it's taken the state of California so long to start building projects at the Salton Sea. I'm not gonna go into all these given limited time, um, but I've listed many of them right here. Uh, this next slide uh, shows one of the, the big challenges of the Salton Sea is simply the scale of the sea itself. It's a huge, huge body of water. Largest lake in California, um, largest lake in the Colorado River Basin. Uh, so any uh, intervention at the Salton Sea, of course, is gonna to have to be quite large as well. Next slide. Uh, another challenge at the Salton Sea uh, is the, the very complicated land ownership patterns there. So this checkerboard pattern um, underlying the, the, uh, the sea's lake bed um, shows just how challenging it is to put together different projects because you have to uh, not only overcome various regulatory hurdles, but um, identify land ownership, uh, work out easements and access figure out liability, which has really slowed the state down uh, these past three or four years. Next slide, please. Um, fortunately, uh, the sea has uh, met a lot of the, the management challenges. So I had a similar slide uh, to this when I used to present on the Salton Sea years ago, and uh, all of these boxes, except for the, the first one, were unchecked. So we've made a lot of progress in the, in the past several years. So management needs for the Salton Sea water, uh, even though the amount of water flowing into the Salton Sea is, has declined considerably since the QSA was signed and will continue to decline going forward, there's still hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acre feet will flow into the Salton Sea uh, as long as there's agriculture in the region. 
So most uh, restoration or ecological challenges in the West, the biggest single challenge is the absence of water. And the good news for the Salton Sea is there's plenty of water available. The challenge is to optimize the use of that water, but there is water and we don't need to go out and, and find that water. Uh, often there's a challenge with the lack of consensus on what solutions look like for this, uh, for any restoration project. But the good news, certainly for the short term, is there's broad stakeholder consensus on what uh, projects are needed at the Salton Sea. Uh, and in the past several years, we've identified and secured more than $350 million in funding for Salton Sea activities. Certainly not enough for all the projects that will be required at the Salton Sea, but enough to cover uh, foreseeable costs for the next several years. Uh, and as was mentioned, the recently or the 2017 stipulated order provided uh, milestones for the, the state's projects and the state is committed through its 10 year plan to meeting those those milestones uh, has a ways to go uh, to meet those, but uh, it's developing plans and uh, starting to put those projects together. And then finally, political will uh, was the biggest, the biggest single impediment to moving forward at the Salton Sea. Uh, the previous three administrations in the state of California kicked the can down the road. The good news is uh, with the, the current administration, Governor Newsom, uh, prior to becoming governor, went down to the Salton Sea. Uh, the first trip uh, for the Secretary of the Resources Agency was at the Salton Sea. So we're finally seeing the political will, the commitment to moving forward at the Salton Sea. So that leadership, which had previously been absent, is now being demonstrated for Salton Sea. And we're starting to see that progress being realized. Next slide, please. So what do solutions look like at the Salton Sea? Well, in, in general concept, it's pretty straightforward capture the water that's flowing in from these rivers and drains from uh, agricultural fields at both the south and to a lesser extent at the north end, capture that water, spread it out. So that's uh, what this graphic or this cartoon shows is capturing that water, put it in habitat cells for birds. Uh, you can raise fish or fish can, can thrive there. Uh, and then that water can also be spread out for dust suppression. Next slide, please. Uh, and we know this can be done because 15 years ago, a couple of federal agencies built 100 acres of similar ponds. And we saw more than 200 different species of birds use these fairly small ponds uh, in very, very large numbers. There are also uh, an estimated million endangered pupfish in these ponds. So the concept is proven, we know it can work. Uh, and that's essentially the, the route that the state is, is pursuing is building more and more of these habitat cells. Uh, the Species Conservation Habitat Project uh, recently started in January of this year. It's going to build about 4,000 acres of, of similar habitat at the Salton Sea. Next slide. Uh, and then as director, sorry, previous slide. And then as uh, Director Hamby just mentioned, uh, IID is uh, through the QSA JPA constructed more than 2,400 acres of dust suppression projects uh, at the Salton Sea. Uh, there's a lot of monitoring out there, and we know that these uh, dust suppression projects uh, have been effective. So we've got habitat, we've got dust suppression, we need to start building on community resources and uh, integrating uh, community needs uh, into this planning process, but progress is being made. Next slide, please. So some of the lessons uh, that we've learned over, over the course of these, well, really 20 plus years now, uh, is that we need clear goals and objectives and that we're still encouraging the state of California to uh, enunciate its goals and objectives for the various Salton Sea projects and its broader vision for the Salton Sea as a whole. Uh, I guess one of my greatest regrets uh, in working 20 years on the, on the Salton Sea is that back when the QSA was signed, we did not insist on assessing a, a fee to each acre foot, a unit fee on individual volumes of water to provide a, a steady revenue stream for operations and maintenance. So this uh, absence of operations and maintenance funding has been a stumbling block for projects moving forward. And given the volumes of water moving out of the region, some 300,000 acre feet plus, uh, that would have been a good uh, source of, of revenue. Um, we also learned that legislation and, and funding alone are not sufficient. Uh, that was surprising. There was clear statutory direction from the state of California passed back in 2002, which was not sufficient to get the state of California agencies to actually start moving at the Salton Sea. Uh, another thing that we learned is that 
the legislature needed to provide more accountability on these agencies by holding hearings, particularly in this um, interim 15 year period, more frequently to hold the state agencies to account as to what they were doing for the Salton Sea and where that money was going. And finally, um, that uh, political will is the, the key ingredient. Uh, we've often said that had the Salton Sea or if the Salton Sea were located next to Los Angeles or Sacramento, this problem would have been solved many, many years ago. Next slide. And I've just posted a few uh, websites for further reading. I think these will be recorded and, and posted up. And I'll hand it off to Frank for an in-depth dive on uh, the ecology and impacts at the Salton Sea itself. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. And welcome to the Salton Sea. The Salton Sea is a place plagued with uh, inequities and inequalities, especially affecting the environment, public health, and the economy of the region. My name is Frank Ruiz, and I am the Salton Sea Program Director for Autobahn in California. In the next 10 minutes, I'm going to try to bring it home. Next. Only 60 years later, uh, the ones called the California Riviera that attracted many luminaries from Hollywood that came for boating, fishing, fine dining, clubbing, golfing, etc. Now it's dealing with uh, one of the worst environmental, public health and economic crisis of modern history. Next slide. From the environmental perspective, the loss of water and rapid evaporation is definitely changing the ecosystems. As can be mentioned, in California, we lost over 95% of the wetlands that connect, that helped the birds, so the migratory birds from Alaska all the way down to Argentina. The Salton Sea remains one of the last standing jewels along the Pacific Flyway. The high levels of salinity, we have a program and we measure salinity every month among other different parameters. And we see that salinity is spiking rapidly. Oxygen saturation is also going down rather rapid. They, we're losing a lot of habitat. Water quality is definitely one of the issues. We're seeing more uh, cases of cyanobacteria episodes, not, not only affecting the wildlife and the birds, but affecting the people altogether. We're losing a lot of um, uh, diversity not just in birds, but in the food networks. In past decades, we were able to count over 400 different species of the Salton Sea. Now in our data, we are only seeing no more than 250 different bird species that, that are being counted. We're losing food webs. The salinity, the changes in the ecosystem is rapidly affecting what the birds are eating. And most of the shorebirds are only feeding or 99% of water boatman bugs. This is problematic because everyone knows that in any ecosystem that is losing its diversity, it's uh, the brink of um, a major collapse. Next. From the health crisis perspective, it is not a shock for everyone that we're dealing with one of the worst asthma and CPD rates in the state of California. The region is played with poor air quality index. In 2017, I put a documentary together and we interviewed many of the families and it's not surprised out to anyone that many of the young kids are dealing with nosebleeds. We met this family, a family of five, mom, dad, and three kids, nine, six, and four. They all have to go to bed cooked to this humidifier, and they have to walk to school carrying an inhaler and a bronchodilator. It doesn't need to be this way. Next slide. The region itself is played with a lot of economic issues. The LA Times once wrote an article calling this region the almost forgotten land. We have the, high, the second highest unemployment rate nationwide. We have an affordable housing. 
if you walk along the border, you're going to see encampments of farm workers who unfortunately are not able to afford a decent housing. One out of five in this in the county of uh, Imperial live in poverty, and 85% of them are Latinos. 800,000 farm workers only make an average of 18,000 a year for an economy that is hitting with higher housing issues. This is uh, really exacerbating the existing conditions. Next slide. Audubon has been working on the ground for at least five or six years. Prior to that, we've been working in policy from Sacramento and Washington DC. But we decided to put the boots on the ground, understanding that we need to be more hands-on. And I will say in the last seven or eight years, we have seen a lot of the, uh, a lot of wetlands emerging around the Southern Sea. As the agricultural drains are no longer reaching the sea anymore, the water is percolating through the ground, creating these beautiful wetlands. We wanted to demonstrate what an optimal way of using every drop of water, not only for habitat restoration, but for dust suppression, uh, community access, education, and research. And we decided to identify these wetlands. And I know that um, uh, images speak uh, more than words. And uh, we created this video clip to illustrate the project that we're working on the South End. If you can play, please. Sultan Sea. California's largest lake and one of the most important areas for wildlife and birds along the Pacific Flyway is shrinking rapidly. Its slow death is affecting millions of migratory birds and potentially the health of more than 650,000 people that live nearby. Changing water patterns means less is flowing into the sea. As what is left evaporates, the sea is getting saltier, making it less hospitable to many types of birds and wildlife. The shrinking shoreline exposes clouds of windborne dust, but awareness is growing about the toll the sea's decline is taking on the human and economic health of surrounding communities. But while human intervention here has been slow, nature finds a way. Natural surface and groundwater seeps in areas like Bombay Beach wetland. Just two miles east of the community of Bombay Beach have created spontaneous pockets of green. These new wetlands support a wide variety of species, plants, birds, reptiles, and more, some of them endangered. The Bombay Beach wetland formed where washes carrying stormwater, naturally flowing streams, and groundwater converge to create a special habitat. Audubon recognizes the importance of these wetlands and their potential benefit for local wildlife and communities. Together, in coordination with the Imperial Irrigation District, the Bureau of Reclamation, and California Natural Resources Agency, we are moving ahead with the Bombay Beach Wetland Project. When it is completed, it will help protect and stabilize existing habitat areas, create new playa and wetland habitat areas as the sea shrinks, reduce evaporation and expand vegetation and habitat to curtail harmful wind blow dust, and provide public access to nature areas for wildlife viewing, education, and research. We're currently beginning work on phase one of the project, including selecting the design concept, performing biological resource studies, engineering analysis, and preparing the preliminary design. For more information, please visit our website or contact us directly. Thank you very much. And we can bring it back to the last slide. This is a multi-benefit habitat enhancement and dust control demonstration project. And so for some of you that may not know, next slide. These wetlands are located on the south end of the Southern Sea. They're located on the northeast shore of the Southern Sea between the community of Bombay Beach and the Nylon Bow Ramp. This is located at the confluence of several ephemeral and perennial washes. Why is this important? because we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Nature is already doing a lot of the work. We just wanted to take advantage of it and make sure that we 
enhance it and bring in all the multiple benefits. We want to make sure that we demonstrate that we can find the most optimal way of using every drop of water that in this region is rather scarce. Uh, next slide. Why do we do it? Because we need an opportunity for a wetland enhancement of the Salton Sea. We know that we're losing a lot of the habitats uh, around the Salton Sea. And it's important for us because we know that birds need a place where to feed, rest, roost. These wetlands habitats are forming on the emerging playa where water flows and discharges concentrate. But these habitats are vulnerable. Erosion can definitely um, uh, destroy them. The wetland drainage from eroded beach berms, groundwater levels decline, and invasion of non-native species such as tamaris or salt cedar uh, are really a threat for these wetlands. Next slide. These are the proposed uh, objectives that we have. We want to protect the existing habitats from erosive damage, drainage, and degradation. We want to establish playa shrubs and wetlands habitat areas as the Southern Sea recedes. We want to optimize water retention and use it for environmental benefits, habitat, and dust control. We know that um, adjacent to the wetlands, there are areas where uh, only water suppression, only water will suppress you know, the dust erosion provide public access for viewing, education, and research. We know that communities are longing to have some recreation benefits. And unfortunately, it may not be the, the recreation opportunities that they may want to see, such as boating or fishing. Perhaps those days are long gone. But nonetheless, we want to make sure that we can provide some, some recreation opportunities, such as uh, bird watching, picnicking, uh, hiking, et cetera. Next slide, please. The implementation of the plan is basically occurring, we're currently uh, selecting the design concept in consultation with stakeholders. This video clip was created to inform the community. We wanted the community to know this is what's going on and we want your participation. We, before we launch the design of the wetland project, we wanna make sure that you guys are well informed and, the, and we are, we're looking for community uh, input. Uh, we're currently performing the biological resource studies, engineering analysis and preparing the 35% design. We work out uh, with uh, many of the stakeholders, especially the US Bureau of Reclamation, IID, uh, CNRA. And we're in, the, in year one uh, during the conceptual design phase. Year two will be the design and the permitting and year three will be the construction other wetlands next year. I mean, next slide. Audubon is well known for um, knowing a, a thing or two about birds, but we wanted to take a multidisciplinary approach to this project. Understanding not just you know the avian biology, but understanding the surface and groundwater hydrology, planning and permitting, the engineering, aquatic and terrestrial biology, but overall we wanted to make sure that we connect with communities, we connect with the people that live around this uh, region because we wanted to uh, have a better understanding what is it that they need and want, how will they like to shape you know, the uh, design of this project. And um, next slide, please. This is what we're dealing with. Water, as I mentioned, is rather scarce in this region and the wetlands are located within this, uh, what we call the Pacific water, wa Pacific wash watershed. As you see, number, uh, number two is uh, the Coachella Canal. Uh, number three is the hot springs geothermal area. A lot of the water is being discharged, you know, from this region, it's being collected and it runs down all the way down to uh, the Southern Sea. The 2002 shoreline berm and the Bay Bombay Beach uh, wetlands all the way down to the South. Next slide, please. One of the things that we wanted to understand is uh, how much water we have available. And we know based on the preliminary hydrological uh, studies that we've done, that we have at least 2,500 to 3,000 acre feet of water, enough 
to enhance these wetlands and perhaps create more vegetation areas. We know that um, we have to count all the uh, perennial and ephemeral uh, uh, water that is running into these wetlands. But we also know that um, with uh, a little more understanding, we will be able to project um, uh, water in a more sustainable way. Next slide. The idea is basically ponding the water, creating a retention basin and allowing this pond to uh, infiltrate, infiltrate the water all the way down to the wetlands to, for, to protect the existing habitat areas. And as the sea continues to recede, we may use more of this water to create future wetland habitat areas. The, in years you know, where water is more abundant, we can use the water to uh, create spills and create more vegetation enhancements in areas where water is rather not available. And we know that uh, protection and maintenance of existing habitat areas is important. We know that enhancement of future habitat areas is important. And we, want, we are um, very intentional on making sure that we use water in the most efficient way. Next slide. This is, you know, a preliminary design concept. As you can see, it is on a, uh, we're magnifying the, the the previous slide, and you can see the spills on both sides of the of the pond, and the lateral spills. And the idea is that we can create more vegetation area, that we can create, uh, expand the wetlands, protect the existing ones that we have, and as the sea recedes, we can perhaps, you know, cover uh, more of the exposed playa with uh, newer vegetation areas. And thank you very much. Uh, next slide. And this is, you know, the end of my presentation. Thank you for the invite. I appreciate that. All right, Connor, was there anything you were going to say before we get into our question and answer session? No, I think we should roll right into it. Thank you. All right. Uh, for those of you that uh, didn't see me earlier when I popped on, I'm Dee Zink and I'm co-chair with Connor of the Southern California Water Dialogue. What a dynamic panel today. It's a lot of information and it of course builds on our panel last month talking about the challenges that we have in the Colorado River watershed. Uh, it's a very dynamic watershed and it's not moving in a positive direction in terms of abundance. And so I wanna thank the panel um, for their presentations and uh, Patrick O'Dowd for putting the panel together. But what I'd like to do is remind everybody how to ask a question. This is a dialogue. And we've asked our speakers if they would be willing to stay a few minutes later um, in case uh, we continue to have questions. So just a reminder that at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a Q&A button. If you would press that button and um, bring up the screen so that you can type your question in, I'm gonna go ahead and walk through questions. I've noticed a couple of comments on the chat, so I will address those as well. If you like a question that somebody else has entered, you can give it a thumbs up and that will bring it up to the top of our list. And we'll try to get through these questions as quickly as possible. And so as I start to um, bring up the questions, I just wanna let people know that there was, the first one out of the shoot is, can we get a link to the video? And I wanted to um, let everybody know, not just the introductory video, but all of the presentations are being recorded and both the individual presentations and the recording of today's program will be available on the Southern California Water Dialogue website, which is SoCalWaterDialogue.org. And I think we'll put that up at the end of the program. So you will have access to these materials. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and start with a question from Leon Shapiro. And his question is, can anyone quantify or qualify how much of the health problems and asthma in the area are related to dust produced from the exposed playa and uh, or of the Salton Sea, excuse me. <clears throat> and how much is related to the emissive deserts um, the, to the west of the sea, which would not be affected by any of the remediation? I don't know who would be the best to answer that question. I'm gonna take a stab. Um, I'm gonna start with Patrick and let Patrick um, turn it over to, I'm guessing it might be um, Michael Cohen. I, I think both uh, Michael and, and, and Frank will have some thoughts on this. It's, it's been a concern of mine for as long as I've been involved with the Salton Sea. Uh, and, and, the, and the answer is it depends on who you ask. Uh, I think that uh, 
you know, there, there, there are, it, it, and how you ask the question. Uh, I think that the, 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 the difference between whether the playa is an issue or the windblown sand is an issue, or frankly, the, the impacts from, from Mexico are an issue. There, there, there's an entire uh, spectrum of challenges that affect the air quality in the region and anything that contributes negatively to it is, is harmful. But I would, I would invite Michael and then Frank to jump in and anybody else that would wanna tackle that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, and certainly an excellent question and one that's uh, the topic of uh, increasing amount of research. You see Riverside, um, there's a, a whole research team that's looking into this. And um, one of the, the tools they're using is to identify the different chemical signatures, the chemical composition of the um, salt and sea playa differs from that of the desert. So trying to identify those differences and then how that affects human health is uh, an ongoing topic of, of research. Um, one important, uh, I guess, piece of context for that is that both the Imperial and Coachella Valleys were in non-attainment, had serious air quality uh, challenges prior to the, the shrinking of the Salton Sea. So uh, the problem is that the Salton Sea is, as the Salton Sea shrinks, it's exacerbating an already bad situation. So it's not that it was great before and it's terrible now, it was terrible before and it's getting worse. Frank, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, in addition to the chemical composition that UCR is studying, they are also studying uh, the fumes that are uh, being emitted from the sea. Uh, they, they've been placing canisters to collect the fumes because you know this is you know, how they are trying to approach it. Um, many of the uh, elements, you know, that come in contact with the water do not always stay underneath the water or they're trapped by water, but rather they, they morph into different uh, uh, fumes. So they are uh, studying right now how much of those fumes are actually contributing to the, uh, the kind of asthma uh, that is present in these communities that is very different from many other uh, asthma cases uh, in other places. Can any of you address how the current promise, as we're saying this is turning promises into projects, um, those projects will um, address this, these challenges? So I, I think it's, I, I think that's exactly right. I think that it's projects plural, right? I think for, for a number of years, we've been looking for, for a, you know, a project and whether it's the state's preferred alternative or plans uh, advanced by, by others, I think what we're looking at right now is, is really a three-legged stool, looking at the landscape scale efforts that the state's undertaking for mitigation and habitat restoration. They have a goal, they have a mandate, and frankly not a goal of 30,000 acres in their first 10-year plan. So that's, that's what the state is working on. There's also an effort to develop a long-range plan, basically the backbone that all of this and future plans will, will, will uh, be tied to. And then there's a third, the efforts within the communities themselves and the mitigating the, the, the real and felt needs of each individual community around the sea. And that's a space, frankly, that the authority has taken, a, taken an, some ownership of. Uh, but I would invite anybody else to contribute in that regard. Anyone else? Okay, I'm going to go to the next question then. Uh, Joan Taylor is asking JB Hamby if you would please elaborate on the issues of impediments to IID storing more water in Lake Mead and how addressing those impediments might improve the situation. Yeah, that's a, a really good question. Um, so prior to the QSA, IID had an elastic uh, water right on the Colorado River. There's various users in California, you, going in terms of priority, you have Palo Verde Irrigation District first, the Bard Water District next, who's on the California side from Yuma, Arizona. Then you have IID next, and then the Coachella Valley Water District. After that ag pool, which has 3.85 million acre feet per year, that's followed by Metropolitan. Um, and so prior to the QSA, and mind you, the, the letter Q in the QSA stands for quantification. So before that, there was no cap on how much or how little IID needed to use in any particular year, just so long as that those four ag districts did not exceed that 3.85 million acre foot cap, uh, which never really happened. However, in order to facilitate these transfers in the late 90s and, and early 2000s, culminating in the QSA in 2003, IID was capped at uh, 3.1 million acre feet per year. Um, 
And, and from that 500,000 acre feet was taken out to meet these transfer obligations. So like Michael pointed out, and I believe in one of his previous slides about how much IID has, has conserved uh, to the tune of near 5 million acre feet since the, the QSA in 2003, there's also been some water that we've over conserved over time. We've been too good at conserving water, but instead of us having a home to put that water in, like Lake Mead, that thick, you know, a, a bathtub ring that you can, you can see all the empty space in Lake Mead that needs to be filled up over these next few years. IID has not been able to put any water in there other than a very thimble full of water allowed to us under the 2007 ICS agreements. So that's been very unfortunate because there's been lots of opportunity that has gone by. Many feet could have been added to the elevation of Lake Mead over time. Um, and, and that could have helped IID in the long run because uh, that water can ultimately make its way back into the Imperial Valley and, and make its way into the Salton Sea. So the unfortunate thing there is that we are not allowed to have any credit and be able to use the water uh, that we don't use in a given year, unlike other districts, both within California uh, or especially in Arizona, where if an agent, if a district doesn't use their full entitlement in, the, in a year, they can take that water off of the river and put it into a reservoir, or in the case of Arizona, spread it across the desert and then let it percolate into the ground. Uh, we don't have that uh, opportunity due to our geography. We don't really have any substantial sizable reservoirs except for a uh, thousand acre feet or two, which certainly doesn't fill, uh, doesn't allow for us to fill up the 150,000 acre feet we would like to store away some years. So there's a lot of opportunity uh, to be had in not only uh, for the Salton Sea, but the larger Colorado River Basin as a whole, uh, when it comes to IID being able to store uh, these overconserved and unused waters for the benefit of, of the entire basin. And, and the, the difficulty here is that when we're not allowed to store those waters in Lake Mead, that continues to precipitate the decline of Lake Mead because we're not helping to offset those losses that the rest of the basin is contributing to. And the effect is, is everyone starts to turn their eyes to IID and says, hey, well, you're the biggest user on the river. You need to make the biggest cut. But our position is we've given up more than anybody else at this point. We, we'd love to help out additionally, but we need some help as well. Uh, and, and one of those things we'd love to help out with is filling up that, that empty bathtub ring around Lake Mead. But uh, based on the current rules, we're not allowed to store much, if any, water other than effectively a thimbleful at this point. Well, and I want to say, uh, JB, you started out by talking about um, conserved water, which is an important aspect of that, that if there's active conservation, and I think um, agencies are interested in working with IID on um, conserving that water as opposed to water that would move down in the right system. Um, let's go to the next question, which is from Carl Seckel, and he's asking, are there readily available plants that can grow on the playa in terms of restoration? Um, so the quick answer is yes, plants are growing on the playa where there's water. So as uh, Frank's video showed, uh, where water's seeping onto the playa, uh, there are plants growing. So yes, is the quick answer. Uh, the water is the constraining factor there. He has a follow-on question that gets to the um, quality of the water and the impact on bird wildlife. Can you address that as well, or maybe you, Frank? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the water quality is a major factor. Uh, we have seen uh, cases in other places where uh, cyanobacteria episodes affect the wildlife and the birds, and that can lead in the other uh, diseases, you know, for the birds. So um, at this point, uh, the water is, is getting to a point where uh, it may not be suitable for, for any kind of life or any of the uh, wildlife. And I'll jump in there a little bit as well about water quality. I think it's important to note that not only is, is water entering into the Salton Sea from Imperial and Coachella Valleys, but you have substantial uh, volumes of water coming in from Mexico as well. So for those of us in Imperial Valley, you have two rivers that course up the, the basically the spine of Imperial Valley, and that's the New River and Alamo River. That is water that's primarily drainage water um, from Mexico, but it also has all kinds of other stuff in it um, that presents health and water quality concerns, like the uh, there's a substantial manufacturing section, section in Mexico 
Uh, and historically, there's been enormous amounts of chemical and industrial waste, and, and more recently, a lot of sewage dumps. This last September, I stood on a bridge over the New River in Calexico, and that was a day uh, in which there was a, an unregulated flow of su raw sewage from Mexico through the Imperial Valley, ultimately ending up in the Salton Sea. So I think that's something important to note about the, the Salton Sea, not only its connection to the larger Colorado River system, but also to Mexico as well. Um, and there's been these ongoing issues that have been around since the 1940s regarding the water quality, primarily in the New River. Um, and so that's still not something that's been addressed. I know the County of Imperial has really worked and tried to spearhead this effort over decades and, and uh, it kind of tends to go in a cycle of, of waning interest and waxing interest on the part of the federal government. But these are, again, some of the unique issues of the Salton Sea and uh, the new and Alamo rivers because they're they are very local to us, um, but they're also federal in many ways. And so, but because of their unique nature to a relatively small uh, that is deeply affected, uh, affecting a small population, they tend to be overlooked despite how extreme uh, circumstances they tend to be. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I'm going to skip over and skip back to a question just to, because it's a similar, um, similar set of issues. That is, what is the annual water balance for the Salton Sea? How much desalin desalination would it take each year to keep the sea in balance? Um, who would like to take a shot at that question? Michael, you want to talk about road salt? So the, the question seems like two different questions. Uh, the water balance. Uh, the season deficit, which is why it's shrinking. So current inflows to the Salton Sea are about a uh, little under 1.1 million acre feet, uh, which is more than was projected by some of the models, uh, but still 200,000 plus acre feet less than was flowing into the Salton Sea 18 years ago. So the sea is shrinking. Uh, this roughly 3 million uh, tons of salt flow into the salt into the the Salton Sea each year by um, agricultural runoff and a little bit from uh, other sources. Um, so 3 million tons of salt, I think is what uh, JB was pointing towards, uh, is roughly a square mile of salt, uh, three feet deep. So that would be the waste stream. If you wanted to maintain the salinity of the salt sea at its current salinity, you'd have to completely desalinate all that water. Uh, so then you'd have to dispose of a pillar of salt, uh, which would quickly uh, reach into the sky, which could be another tourist attraction for the region, but perhaps not the kind we're looking for. Well, and that leads to a question by Shelley Posner, and that is, is there any um, discussion about ocean water being brought in via siphon to the Salton Sea to be part of the solution since the ocean water is less saline than the sea itself? Um, so I'll, I'll start this one off. Um, so absolutely, there's a lot of discussion about that. Uh, the state of California recently contracted with uh, some researchers, professors up at uh, UC Santa Cruz to explore this question. Uh, there's eight, I'm sorry, 11 different proposals to uh, do just that. Uh, one of the big challenges is that although ocean water is less salty than salt and seawater, it's more than 10 times as salty as the water that's currently flowing into the salt and sea. So not, uh, you would not just have uh, a pillar of salt, but you'd have multiple pillars of salt reaching into the sky if you're trying to get the salt out of that water and, and stabilize the salinity of the salt and sea. Um, also, uh, the good news for the Imperial Valley uh, and Imperial Irrigation District and Coachella Valley is that although much of it's below sea level, there is a, a, a slight elevation gain there, which is why the ocean's not pouring in right now. So you'd have to pump ocean water 300 plus feet uh, over this berm, which would be hugely energy intensive, uh, adding to carbon emissions and uh, kind of creating a positive feedback loop. Um, so it's it's being explored. I think the single greatest challenge for these import uh, schemes is that it would take 20, 25, 30 years to get this all permitted, permitted, um, get land access across an international boundary, get an inter international treaty to allow for that. Uh, to satisfy whatever Mexico might want uh, in exchange for pumping this water in and pumping salt and sea water out. Uh, and so we don't have a generation to solve this problem. We need to solve this problem right now. Uh, and then, and there's billions of dollars to, to actually build something like that. So yes, people are talking about it. Um, it's, I guess, feasible at some level, but hugely expensive 
and then you have a major salt problem to to address with that. And, and I would only, I would I would only um, interject that it is it is the 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 um, the solution that you hear the most about in the community and and around. Um, and, and I think the challenge with that is I know that the authority has looked at it in the past. The authority has has endorsed you know individual efforts to pursue projects that work that make sense. Uh, but the challenge is. You know, with the state and federal dollars available, every dollar that we spend on this is a dollar that we can't spend on that. So a lot of time and effort is being invested and the state is committed to evaluating that. The state is also committed to developing a long-term plan and that will be considered as a part of the state's uh, portfolio of options in their long, long range plan analysis. But, but it, is a, it is a question that needs to be answered so that we can so that we can move forward with, with projects and solutions that uh, again, transition the sea to what it can be. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Frank, there's another question related to the Bombay beach area. Um, the question's from Stephen Farrell and he's asking um, how stable the shallow water table is and is it the result of the sea? Um, is it saline as well? What, what's the situation with the water table? Yeah, uh, most of the water that, that, that feeds into the uh, Bombay Beach wetlands come from, uh, from some of the uh, fisheries and uh, resorts on the north end. So um, it's, uh, it's groundwater and it doesn't have uh, most of the issues that uh, the Colorado water uh, brings with. So we do not suspect to find the same issues such as uh, um, the levels of salinity and selenium and other issues. Very good, thank you. Okay, our next question is from David Ever Everly. Well, it was, hang on, I, my screen just jumped on me. Um, and he's asking, how does the panel view California's movement to potable reuse affecting the Salton Sea? Also, has IID considered investing in agricultural water conservation to help the sea itself? And he's specifically referring to the use of hydroponics, which is 90% more water and nutrient efficient. I think we ought to let Dan take a first crack at that. He's been sitting on high idle for a while. Yeah, you see the reuse pipes in the background. No, um, they, I, I think that uh, water reuse is the, the future of, of water in, in Southern California. Um, you know, I, I think the extent to which um, that source can be, um, can help offset demands on the Colorado River. Um, I, I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity there. And, and I would throw uh, seawater desal into the mix as well. And, um, you know, I can speak a little bit to um, some of the things that the Metropolitan Water District is doing with the Southern Nevada Water Authority um, to look at trading um, uh, reuse water for Colorado River water. Um, and, you know, I think the same can be said about uh, uh, desal water that the San Diego County Water Authority has to offset some of the demands on the river. Now, how that translates back to the sea, not quite sure that the, the two are relatable, but nonetheless, it's an it's a offset. I'd like to ask JB to take a shot at the question as well, because I think part of um, what was embedded in there is the practices within um, the IID service area and the potential impacts to the Salton Sea. Right, I think the, the question was something along the lines of why doesn't IID do more conservation to basically refill the Salton Sea? There's a couple problems with that. First of all, the reason that the Salton Sea is in the present situation is in is because there's been extraordinary and expensive amounts of conservation that have gone into moving water to urban Southern California and in doing so less water is in the Salton Sea. So the remedy for that is, is spelled out in the QSA and the state's responsibilities there. It, it wouldn't seem to be the answer to fixing conservation by doing even more conservation um, in, in, in which case we're we're generating even more water to then dump into the Salton Sea, which is not particularly smiled upon in a time of drought on the Colorado River. Um, so that's kind of the, the general response there. Uh, it would be much cheaper, I would think, for doing what Dan is talking about in terms of the, the conservation and the desal and the, and the ocean uh, and all the uh, stormwater reuse on the coastal areas in the long term uh, and needing to take less water out of the Imperial Valley, that would seem to be perhaps more cost effective than trying to do double conservation in Imperial Valley to fix conservation with even more conservation. 
and facilitating exchanges. Okay, uh, let's go to John Armstrong's comment then. He's asking, can you rank the cities most impacted by the diseases and conditions associated with the dust, water toxins, and air toxins? A, a ranking may not be required, but maybe just giving an outline of uh, which communities are most impacted. Patrick, is this a question for you or do we wanna um, go to Frank Rees on this as well? So Frank probably has more more granular data. I think you know that every community around the sea is affected, and they're they're affected in different ways. The wind, depending on the direction of the wind and the constituents that are affecting them. But I don't know. There there are certainly communities that are more proximate to the sea and communities that are further away from the sea. But I think anything in the eastern Coachella Valley and the Imperial Valley is being affected by the decline of the sea. Um, and Frank might have some more specificity on what cities in particular are most troublesome. Sure, I can uh, elaborate, elaborate a little more. Um, it depends on the wind's direction as um, Patrick you know, was mentioning uh, in the uh, anecdotal stories and uh, in community uh, science, uh, people have found that uh, most of the year, uh, the wind blows from north to south affecting the communities in the Imperial County. But during the summer, and particularly around September, the winds, you know, change pattern and they start affecting the communities on the north end, uh, such as uh, North Shore, Mecca, Oasis, uh, basically north, north of the, uh, of the Southern Sea. Thank you, Frank. Um, and I'm going to um, check on everybody's time because we are over our time right now, but, and I realize we talked to four of our, three, four of our speakers, but not all of them. JB, are you okay to stay a little bit longer? Very good. Okay. Um, so um, John Armstrong had another question and it's a different topic. So I want to go there. And this is about mining the low grade lithium, low grade lithium under the and around the sea. It's been a, a topic on and off over the decades and it has this latest endorsement by Bloomberg and Bill Gates. Um, um, so how, what is the current status um, and will it stick? Is this something that is um, is a possible remedy or, or funding opportunity for the region. I'll jump in a little bit here. So there has been a lot of uh, uh, effort on the part of the state. There's been the formation of the, the Lithium Valley Commission uh, that's uh, tasked by the state of California to investigate the development of this lithium resource. As California and the nation are moving toward uh, electrification in this greener future, uh, one of the, the ingredients for that is, is batteries, which require lots of lithium. And so that can be sourced from all corners of the world, but one of the better sources of it, especially if you're looking to do so in an environmentally uh, sustainable fashion is, is along the, the shore of the, the Salton Sea and uh, underneath the current Salton Sea. And so over time, as, as, uh, as salts deposited over millennia, uh, lithium has been one of those, those minerals that's been deposited and laid down. And so there's a lot going on at the Salton Sea. One of them is, things is, is geothermal uh, energy production. And so that is using the, the Earth's heat uh, that's very close to the surface there. Um, and one of the concepts that works in geothermal energy, which we have a substantial amount of in Imperial Valley on the, the southern end of the Salton Sea, uh, is it's a closed loop system that basically takes brine under the surface, uh, underground, comes up hot as, as steam. And, and one of the, the byproducts of this whole um, thing is removing that lithium uh, from the brine stream. The water gets pumped back into the ground effectively cleaner than it was taken out. And then that lithium is able to be purposed for lithium batteries and your, your Tesla or your iPhone or so forth. So that's an opportunity that's being developed right now all around the Salton Sea. And so uh, there's a lot of fingers crossed around Imperial Valley to see this, uh, this new industry enter into uh, the valley, which will have a, a real good benefit for the community uh, overall. But it's not uh, terribly connected to the Salton Sea. It's just physically proximal to it. Jimmy, can I just ask, th these are sort of um, speculative uh, projects that are going on right now. Um, are they directly related to IID's energy production and your role as an energy provider in the region? Yeah, so one of the 
as I mentioned about the geothermal is you kind of have with some of these new companies that are coming in or investigating the, the opportunity of developing lithium is it's kind of its connection with geothermal is it's almost the tail wagging the dog in the sense that you need a geothermal plant to to move up this this brine stream and remove the lithium. And it also requires a lot of energy to be able to do that. And so that's kind of where the geothermal comes in. It becomes more used for um, generating the power to be able to produce uh, the lithium. So that's, they work a lot with both IED's water and power departments because the water departments uh, around the, the, the lands around the sea and then energy department works with them on, on all the connection to our energy grid. Very good, thank you. Uh, we had two related questions and I, I think I've, let's see, one of them just popped up to the top, but they both related to the use of um, uh, recycled water. And this first one is that the far more regional water quality control board, Colorado Basin executive director, cautioned that if water quality in the new river is improved, Mexico could keep that portion of the total new river water in Mexico. And that would be less water to the Salton Sea. So what are your thoughts on that? And then separately, we have a question about um, treated sewage actually being a, um, a resource for the Salton Sea. So I'd like to hear comments on both of those um, uh, opportunities or challenges. Um, I'll jump in on the on the New River bit. Yeah, there is a there is an odd sort of balance that struck because the the New River or the flows from Mexico constitute somewhere less than 10% of the flows into the Salton Sea. Although every drop counts, drop of either water or sewage in this case. Um, but one of the problems with that, that water debt, it does constitute about less than 10% from Mexico, from the New and Alamo rivers is it is highly polluted. And, and, and clearly there might be an interest sometime in the future of cleaning up that water. But if the water is clean going into uh, into the Salton Sea, there might be an intent to have that water cleaned up and used elsewhere for some higher, more better or higher, better use. Uh, but at least in terms of how people feel about things in Imperial Valley is, is that certainly all those are factors, but there's an understanding or a willingness to have the Clean Water Act also applied in Imperial Valley when it comes to not having raw sewage coursing through our backyards, because I don't think anybody else would like to have that. Um, and then when it comes to cleaning up sewage for the sea, on the California side and the United States side, as opposed to the Mex Mexican side, every drop of water that goes from our wastewater facilities and our cities in Imperial Valley goes into the new river cleaner than the new river is, just like our agricultural drainage. The, the, the reality is that our, our wastewater in Imperial Valley is, is, ends up cleaning up the new river as it moves from south to north into the Salton Sea, uh, which kind of gets into the solution to pollution is dilution. But, uh, still, regardless, it's unwelcome to have large pulse flows of sewage moving through our, our neighborhoods. So I, I know Michael might have a thought on this too, because I think it's an issue that that I know CBWD and the environmental community have have wrestled with over the years is is reusing uh, wastewater in the Coachella Valley, and and it, and it's our and and it was the. Um, um, belief of the district at the time, I think it's it's substantiated that reusing that water for, for agricultural purposes produces a net benefit to the aquifer as a whole. And, and what ends up happening, much of the drain water that flows out to the sea from the Coachella Valley comes out from the aquifer. So, so everything we do to improve the quality of the aquifer increases the drain flows over time. And I think that their projections show considerable increases in those drain flows to the sea and how that water gets used would be decided as part of a long range plan. I've also on the New River, the Salton Sea Authority has been involved with the New River for some time. There's actually $10 million in Prop 68 money for a project that the New River uh, and other uh, state and federal money available to do something there. But as, as Director Hamby mentioned, you know, the, the challenge is, you know, it's kind of devil if you do, devil if you don't. And, and I think you know, one of the things that I've often wondered is it's, it's not a part of minute 323 and they don't deal, deal with any kind of quantification of those resources coming across the border. And I, I, I just consider whether or not that's not a possibility to, to deal with that so that we can establish, because it's, it's gonna take time uh, and effort to clean that water. And, if, and, if, and, and I think history has 
uh, shown in the past, it's my understanding is we've cleaned the water and then they've used it. We've invested considerable money and then we've lost it. So if, if the, if the water is gonna come over and we're gonna pay to clean it, we ought to be able to somehow quantify it and use it and then it be worth, worth the investment. Yeah, if I could just add to that, Patrick, I, I think ultimately um, large scale reuse um, or treatment of sewage water is it's just really, it would be too cost prohibitive. Um, you know, we're talking about something on the, the, the range of $2,500 to $3,500 an acre foot. Um, you know, if, if the primary driver for use of that water was to um, address salinity and elevation impacts, um, it would seem that there are, are, are uh, less expensive alternatives. Michael, did you want to uh, add to that um, or have a different perspective there? Um, we, that could be a whole conversation about uh, CVWD, but maybe we'll have a future water dialogue about that. Okay. Uh, but I think Patrick uh, raises an important point in this, this conversation generally uh, raises an interesting question, which is that at the south end, because of Imperial Irrigation District, uh, there's quite a bit of water flowing into the Salton Sea. But at the north end, uh, as the Salton Sea shrinks, water is especially valuable. So particularly every drop counts at the north end. And as we're looking to build uh, projects at the north end, whether it's a north lake or whatever, or a, some kind of a lake along the northern shoreline, uh, water is extremely valuable up there. So any diminution of flows into uh, the north end of the Salton Sea uh, needs to be carefully explored. Uh, whereas at the south end, there could be 500,000 plus acre feet flowing. And again, as I mentioned earlier, optimizing, capturing that water and optimizing it and spreading it on the, on the landscape uh, is a good way to move forward. So the slight reduction in flows from Mexico may not have that much impact. Whereas even a 10% reduction uh, at the north end could have very sizable impacts. Thank you, Michael. You guys have all been very generous with your time today. I'm gonna to turn over our program back to Connor Everts, my co-chair. And for those of you whose questions we didn't answer, I think most of you got at least one of your questions answered. Uh, we will share these questions with our panelists and try to get responses back to you following the dialogue. So thank you, Connor. Thank you, Dee. Um, I wanna thank again all of our speakers and the organizers and the tech team that puts us on. And um, as, as Michael said, uh, we may have another discussion on this in the future. We've had them in the past. And uh, look to the posting if you're looking for the presentations and um, the actual Zoom presentation itself, the webinar we just did. Um, it takes a little while to get them up, but um, it's a good record. We also have records of all the past dialogues we've done over the last 20 years. So thank you all very much. <laughs>